Hello, Facebook people. So, get you probably some of y'all more than anybody else, but that's okay. All right, well, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and we'll we'll jump back in. <clears throat> Father, I thank you uh, for this crew and Lord their commitment to be here tonight, for their commitment to you, and their commitment to the word. And I just pray tonight as we continue to to dig deep and to think about uh, aspects of spiritual warfare and be reminded of how sovereign you are and how you rule and and reign over all things. Lord, help us to have confidence in, in who you are and your power. But Lord, also help us to, to be on alert for as we have heard and know from scripture, the enemy is prowling, seeking for opportunities to exploit us, seeking for opportunities to, to tear us down. But Father, you have a greater purpose. So we know that even in those weak moments and where we're tempted, Lord, even when we crumble, Lord, you're still sovereign and you're still at work. So help us to trust you in that tonight as we study. And Lord, help us to understand uh, our own weaknesses and understand uh, the schemes of the devil uh, ever more so tonight as we seek to live a life that's obedient to you, one that's victorious, and one that stands in the authority of Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to uh, kind of review a little bit. Uh, and while we're doing that, read our technology in-house online. I think that's oh, one more. We've got so many moving pieces here, folks. Turn that. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, so tonight, let's think about last week. Um, we talked about spiritual warfare. We talked about why God permits spiritual warfare to happen. Do you remember those two main reasons we looked at last week? Those over here. If you have your notes, you're welcome to cheat. I know some of you memorized those handouts that I give you, so I mean, it's just good for you, I guess. Oh, let's see here. I do, but I found that I, I need to give them out at the end. Yeah, but I will give you, if you need last week's, I can give those out. So let's see. Because we talked last week about the fruit of spiritual warfare. Anybody need last week's? You guys need one? Yeah. You need one, ma'am? All right. So as we talk about why spiritual warfare or the fruit of spiritual warfare, why the Lord permits it to take place, really boiled it down to two things. What about it, Shelly? Okay, refinement. Okay, and we even took that and kind of brought that underneath the umbrella of, you know, God wanting to accomplish his will and his purpose, uh, which feeds into the second is to is to reveal his, yeah, to reveal his glory. There you go. There you go. Look at your notes. That's good time. All right. That's all right. We'll allow it. So we talked about uh, to accomplish his purposes. That's why God allows spiritual warfare to happen. And then to uh, reveal his glory. Uh, we talked a little bit about you know, the enemy, Satan, uh, doing things in our life, which may seem like a small loss or maybe even defeat, but yet, yet God comes in and takes those things for his greater good and accomplishes his, greatest pur his greater purpose, um, you know, revealing his glory, him seeing the big picture and accomplishing those things. Um, and then we spend a little time talking about the frustrations of Satan, uh, noting that, you know, he's he has limits, Okay. Uh, his vision is short-sighted. You know, what he may, as we talked about the crucifixion, we talked about the persecution of the church, how on the surface and then why it was happening in those moments, very negative effects. But yet God used those things for, again, the greater good. And we ultimately think about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and, and the role that Judas played, the role that the Jew, I mean, the, yeah, the Jewish religious leaders played, the, the Roman soldiers the denial of Peter. I mean, all those negative things that happened, all those things that Satan had influence on, yet God took that whole scenario and brought about the redemption of mankind. Again, taking what Satan meant for evil and using it for good. Which, you know, that, that directs me back and, and probably you too. You know, as we think about Joseph, remember, you know, all that he endured in the Old Testament, you know, Jacob's son, Joseph. And after they end up in Egypt, the whole family, you know, to save them. And, uh, and Israel or Jacob dies and his brothers or Joseph's brothers are thinking, okay, dad's out of the way. He's going to have us killed now because we sold him into slavery, all these things. And he tore up his nice coat, you know, and that's a little improv, but whatever. But what does Joseph say? What you meant for evil, 
God meant for good. And that's really the, the underlying truth that we look at spiritual warfare. What the enemy means for evil, God uses it for good. He uses it to accomplish his perfect will. Um, so as we think about spiritual warfare and continue to consider it uh, in the weeks ahead as we work through these things, uh, that is a, a truth that we need to hold fast to. Now, you had some homework last week. All right, for those that weren't here, you can still help. All right, here was the question. Uh, we face struggles in our lives. Are all our struggles directly tied to the devil's assaults? If so, how? If not, why? All right? So the struggles we face on a daily basis are all of them spiritual warfare, in other words. If so, why? And if not, why? Like, or how? While you're thinking, I'm going to look over on Facebook and see if we've got anybody chiming in over there. Well, hello there, Patsy. Hey, Diane. Also to make us stronger in the Holy Spirit. That's right, Patsy. That's right. All right, so y'all think about that question online, too. Struggles we face. Is it always spiritual warfare? What do you think? <laughs> this is a loaded question. <laughs> That's what I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We Mm -hmm. No, I agree completely. So we definitely bring upon ourselves, you know, you know, pursuing our agenda, pursuing our will above God's will. Now, sometimes the enemy plays a role in that by saying, wouldn't it be better if you did your thing here? It's quicker or it appears to be quicker, maybe more satisfying in the moment. But then, too, you know, as we'll see here in a moment, our flesh plays a big role, too. You got to understand that we're we're corrupt. We're corrupt to the core. So when you you think about the our own flesh, which is corrupt to the core because of sin, as it enters the world there in Genesis chapter three, then you think of a world populated by corrupt people. Okay, so then you got the world as a factor, and then you've got the enemy too. Those three things, man, this is not a you know, theological uh, dogma or anything, but, you know, we want to call it an unholy trinity. Those three things are it. You know, you've got Satan, you've got our flesh, and you've got the world. And between those three things, that's where our salts come from. That's where our struggles come from. Now, we know that the enemy works in those other two realms. Uh, but, you know, is it, and, and it, this dates me a little bit. Was it Flip Wilson that you say the devil made me do it? Yeah, he never makes us do anything, but he can be there kind of prodding us as he did Adam and Eve back in the day as well. Other thoughts you have on that about our own struggles and if it's always spiritual warfare in our, or if it's just our flesh rearing its ugly head. Anything else? We'll see if they got anything on here. See, so you guys are so talkative. No, no, nothing, Patsy. Okay, nothing. Not, okay, we'll go with it. I can hear Jack, but it's, you know, we'll let him. Just, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, so let's think about these things. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, this week uh, targets of the enemy. Okay, uh, so the question we're going to start out, we can get y'all talking here. When can we expect the devil to attack us? Okay, and whoa. Anytime. anytime, and that's true, anytime. But if we had to boil it down to circumstances, uh, scenarios, if you will, in our life. You're pointing at your wife? <laughs> oh, I was like, Camille, we'll talk after you have a pastoral counseling time. What about it, Camille? Okay. Yeah, it kicks us when we're down, our weakest moments. When you're doing something for the Lord, it comes after you even stronger. Okay. And so the closer you get to the Lord, the more you stay down in heels. Right. So so you're pursuing, you're seeking to be obedient. You're maybe mountaintop experiences, if we want to use that kind of metaphorical language. You know, he's coming at you. All right. Other thoughts you guys have? Those are definitely times I know that I've experienced it in those, and you have too. You know, when you talk to persecuted, what jumps my mind, I agree, is that you talk to persecuted populations. Actually, as they're persecuted, it pushes them, not all about us in America. 
it pushes them closer and closer yes. to God. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. they almost feel it's an honor that mm -hmm. they are worthy of being persecuted. Yeah. And we, we saw a little bit of that last week when we talked about when the enemy went up against the early church. And even now today, um, you know, and Tertullian, you know, church father, his, his quote was, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church because it speaks to the authenticity of their belief. And it's a testimony to those that see them suffer for the sake of the cross, that it means that much to them. And I think on the other hand, too, is when we get, when everything's going good with us, we tend to put, uh, I tend to put God on the back burner. Okay. We, I don't feel like I need him much. I can handle this. Well, and and I, even if that's not a conscious thought, then when he's on the back burner over here, Satan can keep me distracted or right. whatever. Everything even going smooth. Everything so, going smooth. so those seasons of prosperity and, yeah. and smoothness, he attacks those. You know, even, even as Jesus says, you know, how hard is it for the man, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of heaven? Um, you know, not exactly the same parallel, but very similar when you're thinking how everything's working out. The rich man yeah. didn't see a need for God. That's right. We don't, you know, if everything's going hunky dory, we don't tend to, to see that need for him. We become self sufficient and, mm -hmm. and we worship ourselves. And, and Satan's like, let's just keep that going. Yeah. And I think a big part of it, as you said, when we are experiencing or feel like we have self-sufficiency, that's one side. But then the what on one side may be seen as an opposite, maybe, but still it's the same, is selfishness as well uh, puts us in those those circumstances. Yeah. I heard somebody take a breath. Maybe they had another. Okay. Remember, were y'all just breathing back there, girls? Is that what it was? Okay, good. Along, keep breathing. Yeah. Keep breathing. All right. Well, let me. I've got a, just kind of a quick list, and some of these are definitely on that list, and some of them overlap. But just kind of thinking through these. So we're growing spiritually. Uh, that's definitely a time that uh, he's going to attack us. Uh, that's a time that he wants to, um, you know, get us off track. You know, just as we've kind of already noted here, um, he attacks when we're making significant steps of faith. He wants us to slide back into mediocrity. Slide back into complacency, back into that rut where it's everything's well. Go to church on Sunday, sometimes Wednesday. Well, you know, this pandemic, you know, whenever, whenever the doors might or might not be open, I'll be there. You know, he wants to attack those, um, that intentionality that we have to have. He wants to, want us to slip back into, well, if it's not easy, then why bother? But we all know in order to grow spiritually, whether we're in a pandemic or not, you have to take intentionality. You have to you have to move forward. You have to seek the Lord. Not that he holds all far away from us because he's very near to us, but there needs to be that responsibility to move forward. All right. Next one. We're invading enemy territory. Okay. Now, again, that's kind of where we're at with some of these things. But, you know, just as we've talked about, the confidence that we have, um, let me catch them up to speed, the confidence that we have um, in Christ and being that light that he is and how it's reflected in us. And we talked about the confession of faith and, and how uh, Christ told Peter that you can storm the gates of hell and they will not prevail against you. As followers of Christ, we're to be actively, and we talked about it with this armor of God too, we're to be actively taking the gospel into enemy territory. And when we do that, He's going to rear his ugly head. He's going to seek to, to uh, undercut us. Can I just be real with you? I have not experienced the amount of spiritual warfare that I in my life that I have since I've become a pastor. It is It went to another level. Um, so that, as a matter of prayer, I'd appreciate that. But that is something, you know, I'd heard some of my brothers and sisters talk about that on different mission fields and Pastors take positions and guys, being, and then it's just, I mean, it is a different level. Um, you know, some of those, those areas that I'm weak, oh, he loves to just hit them hard. Um, um, but, you know, and that's, and you could probably speak to that too in those moments where, you know, God is preparing you to be teaching something or as God is sending you on a mission trip or all these things. I mean, it's like the devil just takes it to the next level and tries to get your focus off. He tries to get you down in the dumps about who you are, your inadequacies. I mean, all these different things to lead you away from that invasion that you're leading through the gospel. But in those moments, we've got to be reminded of that promise 
that Jesus has made to Peter and those disciples, the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. As you invade, he's going to come at you. But guess what? The gates are still going to fall. And that's something that we have to take confidence in. But we definitely know as we seek to share the gospel, take the light into the darkness, he's going to rear his ugly head. And he does that time and time and time again. <clears throat> We're just afraid, uh -huh. too, sometimes on the, on the flip side where, okay, he makes you insecure and like, you know, that was so stupid. Why did you say that? What, you know, when you're talking to someone, when you're teaching, mm -hmm. he tries to get you insecure. But he also blows wind oh. over stir. Oh, yeah. So, oh, you are so good and you get so full of yourself that. You know, yes. Because I know my son has said, this is what I would like to be doing, but God has said, and he's good at that, but he said, uh uh. Because you would get so full of yourself. This is mm -hmm. where I'm keeping you right here. Yeah, and that calls us back to, to Paul and that thorn in the flesh. He says, God basically said, you're going to keep it so you can be humble. Yeah, this is a struggle that's going to stay so you know to be, you know, to, to know that, hey, it's not you. And Paul, you know, he and you can tell from his writings. I know you guys have worked through the New Testament. You can see that that's probably something he struggled with. I mean, because think about this guy. He's the stuff. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. You know, for us, we're like superstar. And I, and he struggled with that, I'm sure. You know, and this is what, as a pastor and as a preacher, whatever you want to call it, that's what we call the ministry of senior adults sometimes. You know, as you'll be standing at the back door and they'll never fail it. And this is the way the Lord works it out. If you have those moments where you think, man, that was that was finely crafted. You know, that was that was a good one. <laughs> and you have a sweet old lady come through and goes, ah, oh, that that was interesting, Pastor. <laughs> and you can read between our languages like, you lost me when you said hello. All right. <laughs> and and that's when the Lord humbles you. But then there's those moments when you get done teaching or you get done preaching and you sit and it's like, if anybody made any sense out of that, it'll be a miracle. And then you'll hear from folks that, you know, the Lord moved them in a powerful way. And you're like, you definitely know it wasn't me. <laughs> Because I couldn't make sense of anything. And somebody like, amen. Yeah, that's right, Lucas. Never. <laughs> but when we invade enemy territory, you know, he's going to come at us. And he's going to attack our strengths. He's going to attack our pride. All those things. Um, you know, that's one of the things. And I'm not. That's one of the things I know early on when I started teaching and, and preaching a lot. I would intentionally not go to back doors and things like that, even though, uh, and I'm not saying because I did great jobs, because I didn't want to hear you did a good job or whatever, because it fueled something in me. Even though it's, I hate to say it, sometimes it's just token. And I understand that. I mean, people want to say that, but the enemy would use that. And I'd be like, yeah. And then I'd go, so Laura, how was it? And she'd go, well, you know, this is, or just ask Elijah. And then Elijah really set you straight. So then that's when the Lord just kind of humbles you and say, okay, Lord, I got, okay, Elijah, be quiet. I got it. <laughs> so, um, but we can, as we invade in the territory, expect the assaults, but also have confidence. And part of that too is, is exposing the enemy for who he is, calling out those falsehoods, you know, for what they are. You know, when you've got, um, you know, whether it's in the mainstream media, whether it's, you know, a, a teaching that's that's uh, maybe happening within a fellowship or uh, within a, a certain minister, or maybe it's a belief that's held in your house and calling it out for what it is, that it's not, not the truth. Whenever you stand for the truth and expose the lies of the enemy, he again is going to come at you. He's going to seek to tear you down. And, you know, we could, we could delve into that more, but as we see, that's kind of, uh, the same as we see in some of these other areas. So there we go. We're breaking with the world. All right. What do we mean there is, you know, seeking to, to, to pull back from worldly things, seeking to pursue after holy things, uh, seeking to uh, take serious the consecration, being set aside, um, you know, forsaking worldly pleasures. You know, when we take a stand and we say, okay, yeah, the world may say this type of lifestyle is acceptable, but the scripture says this isn't. Or the world may say it's okay to do this with your finance. Well, as a follower of Christ, this is not okay. So taking those stands like that, the enemy wants to, again, come and undercut your feet. Come and label you if he has to as a bigot, as narrow-minded, as old-fashioned. And try to tarnish your reputation, whether we talk corporately as a fellowship or individually, 
uh, to attack your the uh, your reputation or your what appears to be a attack on your character, even though it is uh, it's shallow and not real, but to those seen on the outside, it may be something that they they think has some some weight to. What do you think about that one? Have you experienced that before, where you took a step back, you know, from the way the world was and tried to stand for what was right and had difficulty? I just like to ask a question uh -huh. in in that. I mean, because we as believers on a variety of issues, but let's just you know, the one I faced last week was homosexuality. Right. Yeah. You know, and the comment was, "Well, you're just being, you know, you believe that way. You're being a bigot. You're being judgmental. So how this oh well, this topic, but how, so how do you handle that? I mean, what's the big? My way was, you know, it's not me. It's what Jesus says. It's what the Bible says. Now I don't know if that was the correct way. Or not, but no, I mean, you're you're right, and I think, unfortunately, what's what's happened there is so much of what's come from the church in the past has been hatred, disdain, you know, just this, this heavy handedness when it comes to those that practice homosexuality. Um, whereas instead it should be, we should be coming from, a, as we said this morning, if we've experienced the peace of Christ, that same peace should change our heart in such a way that we look at others with that peace and we seek to, to connect with them compassionately and through grace. Not saying, hey, it's okay, everything will work out, but you know, saying, you know, I'm sharing this with you because, you know, I, I know that God has a plan and purpose for your life. I know that God longs for you to know Him. But this is a this is an unrepentant way of life that puts you at opposition with Him. In order for you to truly know who God is and to experience His love, you know, the Scriptures tell us this isn't this isn't right. And you and you're. You want to be careful not to say, and I don't think you do in that way. You don't want to be careful and be condemning, even though it is wrong, right. but allowing you to speak grace and allow the Holy Spirit to convict them. Because we can't convict them. We can't. We can speak the truth and allow the truth to, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to convict them. But the reality of it is we can't change anybody. Um, and I know that's hard because, um, I mean, that's a, that's an issue that, you know, we face every day in the media. That's an issue we face every day, even in our families and everything of that nature. But it's so important that we come to it from a, a place of grace, a place of, of love as opposed to judgment. You know, whether we're talking about that or we're talking about just the fact that we're sharing that Jesus is the only way. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been called narrow-minded, single-minded, or a religious bigot or whatever because I'm just saying Jesus is the only way where all these other ways are not valid. But again, I come back to the fact that I'm sharing this with you out of compassion. I'm not sharing it so, hey, I can say I'm right and you're wrong. Because that's not it. I'm sharing this with you because of the change that's happened in my life. And I want you to experience that same change, that same hope, that same peace. What do you guys think about that? Maybe similar topics or maybe that same topic uh, as you've encountered it. How have you, how have you handled that uh, when you've had to stand for the truth? You've got to. Yeah, you've got to. You you've can't back down. I think your answer is perfect. Mm -hmm. This is not something you decided. This is something the creator of right. the universe right. said mm -hmm. is the way it is. Mm -hmm. right. And this is what I believe. And he loves you just like he loves me. He created you in his image just like he created me. And his image, if the conversation gets that far, right. it's the behavior that's wrong. It's right. not the desire, it's the behavior. But the thing that what happens and sort of tying this back is because what what I have experienced and what we see, what I see in our world today, of course, I'm not out in the world hobnobbing as much as Todd gets to. I'm <laughs> the hobnobber over here. For UPS. Hobnobber for UPS. I get to stay on the east end of the Ford Road with my head in the sand. <laughs> but what happens is you get to a point, or I have gotten to a point where I feel like I'm the only one that believes the way I believe. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me think it makes me start to second guess what sure. I believe. And I think that's one way that, we'll, that Satan yes. will do this, attack you, is to get you away from your family of God. Right. That's one of the things that when we were in France back a while back and we saw a parade, a pro, what we thought was a protest start, and then I realized, and some of you told me, I realized that they had March for Jesus was what's on the side. And I mean, I just stood there and cried. I thought, there's people in France that believe that. <laughs> so, Amen. But what he's done 
to me is try to get me to, you know, all I'm hearing is what the world's telling me and the world's telling us, even the religious community sure. to a certain extent yeah. is telling us this is okay. Accommodate, yeah. And, uh, and I have to back up and say, God, do I have this wrong? Hmm. And he said, no. But, you know, but I think he does that on a lot of fronts, not right. just the homosexuality front, but that's one of the big ones right now. Right. You know, along the this, the yeah, deception of the devil. And, and, it, and it may not be as blatant as you're wrong. It may be, can't you compromise a little bit yeah. in this? Yeah. Can't you accommodate this? Yes, that's that's a good truth to hold. But, you know, time to change a little bit. Let's mm -hmm. let's be a little more in tune. You know, and, um, and that's hard. It's hard because you want to you want to maintain a connection with culture. Obviously, because we, we seek to connect with culture with the gospel. But at the same time, you have to stand firmly on the truth in such a way that it puts you at odds with the culture and odds with uh, the ways of the world, at odds with what the enemy wants you to embrace. And, uh, you have to realize that you, you, you're going to give up certain things when you do that. Sure. You're going to give up friends. You're going to give up the respect of certain people. You're, you know, you're going to be talked about and looked down on. Right. And you have to just stand firm on what's more important here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely. And if they could ever get to the point, because once he has one was two that chose to know the truth, I believe, that that way, and I mean, I believe that, you know, they were, they were such good friends that, you know, it, Lacey's never gone anywhere, but because of that sin or that, and it's not that she even said anything to that person about it, but because of what she believes, they know that I guess they can't be around her or whatever huh. about it. And one of her closest friends, the guy that she went to prom with, uh, was has turned that way. And it's heartbreaking that I don't understand where they get that it is a hate because we've never shown any hate right. toward their actions. If anything, we've said, you know, we love you so much. We want that, you know, to you to see because you were not raised this way, you know, whatever. And so it's just difficult to see that, you know, it's it's a battle at that moment that the devil has won in this instance with him. But hopefully, at the end of the day, Jesus will overcome. Yeah. You know that, and that's. What and, and part of that is our continued influence and witness with mm -hmm. those individuals that he's allowed to bring into our lives that may struggle with that that sin in that lifestyle. Are you gonna right, say something? They're in the scene, of course. And sure. That's Satan. So Satan's got them blinded from hearing anything that we have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm going through it with a great niece. I'm going through it with a well, great niece. If they've allowed it four years old to choose, then mm -hmm. he wants to be, she wants to be transgender, which is at four years old. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I quit. And of course, I haven't seen anything ugly to begin with. Now, they are attacking Christians sure. just straight over the board. But I just keep plugging on my Facebook page, you know, because we're friends. They don't say anything about it. I just keep putting the word of God out there mm -hmm. and, you know, pray that God will touch them. And I think, you know, whether we're talking about this or anyone that's living in, in a, a lifestyle or a, a habit or practice that's outside the truth, we're coming at them to, from a place of compassion, as we talked about. But because they have embraced this way of life or this action or, or this pattern of existence so much so it's now their truth yes. then they feel they must defend their truth right. whereas we're coming from a pray we're coming from a place of peace where we're seeking to connect with them in compassion they're coming from a place of argumentative posture to validate you, their truth you can you can have a good strong relationship there'll be things that you don't talk about but then there'll be th sure. times when things will come up you don't question them and you've got to be ready. You've got to be so yielded to God that when your mouth opens, mm. and my Sunday school class has heard me talk about this, that you're like, because God comes out. Right. And God has opened my mouth and spoken, and this has been a vessel, and then he shut it down. I've turned to talk to Lord, and it's like, <laughs> and, he's like and he's told me, you, you, this is not going to happen. Yeah. For a long time, 
you think you can intellectualize, it's that's not going to get it. And they are defensive because I think somewhere deep inside them, I know. they yeah. know. Yeah. I know. And so they are. But you can have a really good relationship with them because if you just keep on and you just stand firm, and, you, and I honestly think that right now, if we just said, oh, that's okay, you know, and agreed with that. I think that would rock her world. Yeah, yeah you can't. Because it would be a different you. Yes. Yeah. They'd be like, who's this person then? Yeah. 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 So, so, but you, you can, and you just, you, you, you know, you talk but, about other things. And you, you act like God tells you to act in everyday situations, and they see you, not that we're rock solid, but they see you standing firm and together and rock solid, because there was a point where Satan, he thought he was going to get two or three. Because he had her, and he was driving a wedge between us. And I had to shake my fist in his face and say, you're not getting these two. That's what I was just about to say. At what point, and I know this is in the, the, the yeah, next that's fine. few. Uh, <laughs> no, that's fine. Oh, we're talking about At what point is that spiritual warfare to where we, we know what God's final answer is in the scripture of what it says that we have to stand in the in in, in, in our fist yeah. and 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 the, big, the gates of hell, you know, uh -huh. stand at the gates of hell and 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 fight for that life because right. you know they're living in a lie that's going to drive them straight to hell if they don't set Christ. So at what point, you know, he can come tomorrow and we're set back on our heels. So I know we have to have a happy medium, but at, at what point? Right. Because I know that the the disciples went, you know, and you know, was pretty firm on what those truths are, we've got to be that way too. Is that where in, in Revelations that we've become the lukewarm church that we don't stand up for that? Or? Well, I think what has to happen, and Sonia alluded to it, um, you know, she was talking about her response and, you know, like the Holy Spirit would turn it on and then uh -huh. it would go away. You know, for us, as we seek to confront that and to lovingly, you pray, lead someone to the truth, We've got to be so dependent upon the spirit. Okay, is this the right time to say this? How do I care for them in this? Mm -hmm. But also, too, just as Jesus sent out the disciples, he knew that they were going to encounter people that were going to be unrepentant. There were going to be people that, that did not want to hear the truth. And as hard as it is for us, especially when we talk about people we love, he says, there'll be a time where you may have to dust your feet. Yeah, that's exactly what he's telling me. Yeah, and that's, that's hard because discerning, okay, how... When do I need to be like the shepherd and just go and seek out that, that lost sheep? But then when am I told to knock the dust off and go look for someone else? And every encounter you have with somebody, mm -hmm. whether it's this sin or any other sin, sure. you know, there's other people on that have, who just can't stop gossiping or yeah. gambling or pornography. Oh, I agree. Or I mean, it's, it's right. never just oh, yeah. it is. Every about. encounter we have with them is not get out your Bible and start preaching sure. them. It's developing a relationship with them mm -hmm. so that they see how you act and behave. And then when something comes up, God will either tell you, give you the permission to speak and tell you what to speak, or he'll shut you down because this is not a time because there will be questions that will come up. But they'll see you, right. and then they will value you. And there will come a time where they well, what about this? Well, what about that? Uh, Sarah texts me regularly, but this is a question for the day. If Abraham so and so so and so, -so and they're in their office at a medical facility talking, and she's convincing all her co workers that I've got the answers, and I'm Googling. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what else? Or whatever, <laughs> but so you, you get to, to that point, so it can't be, but then there'll come a time where. If you're like me, you're shaking your boots, but you're going to have to. Right. I'm not in fifty with two. I mean, I think we have a pretty good, I don't know, sure. two, exactly. three or four right. members, and I think we've had a, a great relationship throughout the yeah. um, throughout our lives. But you know, just every conversation just can't be about it. And no. Because right. but the thing that's hard is, tell me if I'm right. Whenever you're in His presence, that's overriding in your mind because of your care and concern for Him and His holy. Right. Sure. So but somehow that's got to be put on the back burner at times, and you just have to talk about the weather yeah. or the ball game or the money. No, I mean, no, that's not a, a, obviously a topic. 
but you know, when he's dressing up change, right. transgender, that's you know, yeah, and, and it's yeah, well, but, that's in your face and right there. And, so, just as you noted, you've known him since he's little. Well, the Lord is divinely orchestrating him to be in your life, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. and for therefore that love and compassion that you have towards him is going to play a role. Will he ever come out? I pray that he does. Mm-hmm. But along the way, he needs to know where you guys stand as a family, mm-hmm. that you stand, you love him, and you stand for the truth. Heaven forbid we get to heaven, and we, I don't know, this is not the way it happens, but you see somebody sliding into hell, and they look at you and say, why didn't you tell me this was right? right. Yeah. yeah. That's and, why I think we're going to be accounted. And that's yes. why I'm saying you can't, you can't straddle the fence, so to speak. No, it's, I mean, you've got to go all out until the Lord says stop. But I think we've got to be able to discern his stop signs too. If it's an easy way out, that's not him. That's not him. If it's a way of, you know, trust me, this is going to be a long haul. This is going to grow you as you seek to help him or her. I mean, and his kingdom is going to be advanced. And that's usually a telltale sign that he says, keep pressing. Um, it's, I mean, it is hard to discern. That's why it's so important that, we ourselves are are seeking to be intentional about our own spiritual growth and not not just going through the motion. So when he does give us a stop sign, when he does say go, when he does have those words in our lip, we're able to discern, okay, now is the time to speak. I'll tell you all this because we are on spiritual warfare right. because I wouldn't tell it otherwise, but I had a dream of him that in Satan was as visible as we, we are here. And I had a dream of where Satan took him and I woke up, it was at three o'clock in the morning, and I texted him immediately. And I said, I don't know where you're at, I don't know what you're doing. Hmm. I said, But the devil is after you. And I said, I have to tell you because God did on my heart, you know, and woke me up, sit me straight up in the bed, you know, of that was what was happening. Right. And he never responded, but he did open it and read it. That is. That's that's how I feel like that, you know, we have to be. We have to be intentional and listen to what God's saying. The obedience. And do it when he mm-hmm. puts it on your mind. So. Yeah, I agree completely. Because, um, you know, as we break with the world, I mean, there's those relationships that are that are part of that. And be able to stand for the truth and not be accommodating or being, oh, it's okay that you're doing this, uh, but to stand with that. So, I mean, there's a lot more that can be said there. Um, Let's see, I think there may be one more, two more. Oh, oh it's not affecting you because I'm doing this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, blessings to come as well. You know, you know, as we, the Lord has us in a season of ready to bring about a harvest in our life or ready to, for a time of fruitfulness, uh, the enemy can try his best to circumvent that. You know, to take our minds off, off this or change our perspective or, or seek to lead us down a path where uh, that 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 imminent fruitfulness may be dampened, if you will, or we lose sight of that. All right. Um, so let's now let's think. We, we talked about when. Let's talk about uh, how. So how does how does the devil attack us? All right. We kind of talked about a lot of these already as we talked about when he does. Um, you know, we we mentioned the the unholy trinity, if you will. It's kind of in passing using that language. So, what is one of what is one of those areas that he he likes to exploit in our life? Our weaknesses, like you yeah, said. our weaknesses, yeah. So, our, our simply our flesh. You know, that's the terminology we see from Scripture. Uh, a couple of passages to uh, direct you to. I'm talking about our, our sinful nature here. Uh, well, let me ask you this: Is I'm trying to think of the best way to say this? Because often it's said, you know, when someone struggle and they have a corrupt or sinful nature, they'll just say it's just human nature. Is that true or false? Human nature and flesh are sinful. We're sinful okay. nature. All right. I would say yes, true, but not originally. No. no? Yeah. Um, and I think that's important, too, as we seek to connect with people and say, yes, we're all broken. We're all sinful. But this is not the way it was intended. Uh, so the point back to that perfect nature, that perfect reflection that we are, and that Jesus comes and, and restores. So I think that's important for us to understand. Uh, so as we think about, come on, you can do it there. Uh, 
the devil likes to exploit our our, our flesh. So we see this in a couple of passages real quickly. Uh, this is in uh, James 1, 14 through 15. It says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. We see this progression. So we have our, our own flesh, our own lust. When it, when it arises within us, that in, gives birth to sin. And then when sin accomplishes it, obviously it, it brings forth death. So, you know, one sin brings forth death. One sin in our life brings forth condemnation. I don't know about you. I have a lot more than one sin in my life, uh, even today. Another passage that you're familiar with, Romans 7, 15 through 24. Uh, and I'll, I'll share this with you. We'll share this with you when we're done. Um, but you're welcome to, to note it. Uh, for that which I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I'm practicing, uh, what I like to do, uh, what I'm not practicing what I like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now lo no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present within me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good, uh, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man that I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of the sin, which is in my members. A wretched man am I. Who will set me free from this body of death? I know that the language kind of gets tangled there a little bit, but you know, as Paul is talking about, as we've said before, the struggle to want to do the right thing, but he's at war within himself. That sinful nature keeps rearing its ugly head. And as he says there in that last line, who will set me free from this body of death? Because it, our sinful nature is on, uh, is, is, well, first off, it brought about death in our life, but then when we accept Christ, you know, it's being kicked out and it's going out kicking and screaming, especially when you've got the enemy coming along saying, oh, this, look at this, look at this, and wanting to provoke us to, to go back and entertain some of those appetites, entertain some of those, those desires, that sinful flesh. And that's something that we're going to we're going to struggle with until we see him face to face, until we see Christ face to face. But just as we noted this morning, um, you know, Christ that began that good work in us will bring it to completion. He'll continuously work in us in such a way that he'll push that sinful nature out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, for, that's for sure. You know, as we think about your own spiritual journey, you know, think about, you know, maybe where you were this time last year or maybe a couple of years or maybe a few months ago. Uh, and think about maybe some of the progress. I pray the progress that you've made in certain areas. Um, you know, I can think about my own journey and some of the things I struggled with. Is it still there? Of course it is. But it's not, it doesn't have that same hold in my life that it once did. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit working in us and us being conformed to the image of Christ. This is what we talked about last week, the fruit of warfare. You know, God taking all those things, good, bad, and ugly for those who love him, and using it to conform us into the image of Christ. So even in these temptations and in the, those opportunities that we come out of the temptation, help us to persevere and to grow and to forsake uh, the flesh. But indeed, it is a body of death that we are walking this earth in. But for us that have placed our faith in Christ, it's a redeemed body of death. So there is hope in us because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and he pushes it out. Uh, and I think it's so important for us, and this is something I think we've all kind of talked about around about, you know, when we become a believer, oh, here we may get a little deep here, but <laughs> this is a good crowd to get there. When we become a believer, the Holy Spirit sets up and residence with in us. It becomes and dwells within us. But then as you look through the New Testament, and as we can see in our own life, there's certain seasons or certain situations or, or moments where the scriptures say, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, we know the Holy Spirit already has filled him or is already in his heart because he's a follower of Christ. But there's times in our life where there is a filling of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So much so that the sinful nature, the um, our own personal will, our selfishness has been forced out. 
that the spirit has taken has taken in the room. And, you know, in those moments, it speaks forth truth into a relationship that needs to hear this. There's moments when you're teaching and able to share this. In this moment where you're able to love the unlovable or to, to proclaim God's authority over situations because the spirit has filled the room and has pushed aside the sinful nature. But then there's times, too, where we fed the old dog and he's made a mess of the house. The Holy Spirit's still there. But it's having a hard time. Hard. To, I'm not saying that God's being limited or God can't do something, but he's been having a hard time glorifying God because of how we've restrained it by our, our choices and our, our poor use of our the, of the, the freedom that God has continued to give us. But guess what? He's not going to stay there like that for long. He's going to say, okay, we're going to clean this mess up. And that's where the discipline comes in. And that's when you know God says, no, I will be made known. And he pushes that mess out. And as you guys know, as well as I do, sometimes, sometimes that can feel like an assault. That's what I was going to say about your question at the beginning. Yeah. I think sometimes we think what might be Satan is really being a, a chastisement at the Lord. Yeah. For the things that we. That's a great point. It, it really could be. Mm -hmm. Maybe thinking, man, the devil's coming at me. But when you take a real step back and go, no, the Lord's, Lord's disciplined me. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for that. I mean, I, I think about my journey as a teenager, young adult. I mean, I knew I was a believer. And part of the validation with that was because of the Lord's discipline. Some things that I was doing, and, and Lane says it so well. And I know some of you have heard Lane's testimony. He says, you know, when you become a believer, sin stops being fun. Mm -hmm. And the things I was participating in where other people were, hey, this is it. I was miserable because of the, the Holy Spirit's work within me that discipline too that was happening in my life as well. But the enemy likes to, to go after that sinful nature. He likes to go after the flesh. But as we're reminded in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if we're in Christ, we're what? We're a new creation. Those old things have gone away with the new has come. And that's something we have to, to focus on. But, you know, he, he does seek to exploit us through temptation, uh, different strategies. So let's think about that just practically for a moment. Uh, Tell you what, I'm going to look over on Facebook. There may could be a hundred different questions over there. Oh, my goodness. All right. Patsy said, don't judge him, love him. All right. Keep praying for him. He likes to make us think we don't have a real relate. That's right, Patsy. He does want us to uh, second guess. He attacks our assurance for sure. But let's think about the strategy of temptation. We'll kind of work through this and kind of wrap things up. Um, but how does the devil tempt us? How does he tempt you? I mean, not to share exact examples or over what, but what's his overall strategy? What does he do? I mean, obviously, kind of as Todd already said, he, he hits the weak areas. Okay. It'll be all right. Okay, it'll be all right. All right. <clears throat> yeah. It'll be all right. Uh, and either that can be spawned out of a place of complacency, or he may even use theology to help us feel that way. So, you know, that's forgiven. It'll be all right. You can do this. Oh, yeah, it's not a so justification in there. You know, look at how they're living their life. I mean, if you just did this or entertain this for a little while, it's not near as bad as other people. <laughs> oh, sure. All right. That, oh, it's the wrong one. Uh, so we can say because the focus aspect's part of it. Definitely. Yeah, he exploits our weakness. He tells us it's going to be okay. He shifts our focus. You know, and you know, kind of as we talked about the truth earlier, he makes it you know makes the truth look a little more appealing. I remember back in the you know dark ages when I was a student minister. Uh, Whatever that is, like yesterday. But I was like, <laughs> no, it feels like it sometimes. Other times it does feel like in the dark ages. There was a skit that I think they did at every youth conference, the sin box. And some of you may remember it. You guys are, you know, my age, maybe you remember it. It was the, it was this, the skit of the year, it seemed like. But there was this big box in the room. It was called the sin box. And you had this guy, and he walked up to it, all right? And, uh, you know, he was like, no, that's sin. I'm staying away from it. But, you know, as he stood there, he just kind of got closer and closer to the box. And then that whole, huh, you know, just a little bit more, anything, and dabbles in a little bit. And long story short, he's in the box 
wrapped up in the box, cannot get out of the box. And it takes, you know, fellow believers to come along and to rescue him out of that, to help him come to a place of deliverance, a place of repentance, and all those things. And, and that's how the enemy works. It gets us just a little bit. It'll be all right. Or nobody's around. Nobody will know. It's not as bad as other people. And before you know it, he gets us to, to dabble in it. And as we dabble, it gets worse and worse and worse and becomes, as we'll talk about next time, and that'll be the question to depart on, becomes a stronghold in our life, a fortress in our life that has to be bombarded with the truth and being broken down. So what is it in this word where they talk about cooking a frog? If you put it in a cold pan, you turn on the heat and it never lines up, it'll, if you drop it in a hot pan right away, it's going to jump up right. right away. So it's, it's the same, same principle. That's right. That's the same principle. And whether we're talking about you know, exploiting our, our sinful nature and our struggle there, or it's when it comes to uh, the truth itself. You know, he attacks and distorts the truth. And he may enter, you know, the same analogy, he may enter just a small nugget of, of falsehood. And before you know it, as I've seen in my experience and my training, unfortunately, you'll see uh, people embrace uh, a certain school of thought, which on the surface seemed like, hey, it's just like everything else that we see in the scripture. It's like, just like what I learned at church. And before you know it, they've gone down this path that's you know, destroyed their family. Maybe even they've taken their own life because of it. Um, and that's getting a little farther out there. But that's also a way that he, he leads people astray, uh, distorting the truth. And we see he tried to do that by doubting God. You know, we see that in the garden. Did God really say that you'll eat this and die? Well, no, it's just this. Uh, we see him try to use the truth on Jesus, even, you know, in the temptation. I mean, this is the Son of God. So if you're really the Son of God, you can jump down from here, and the angels will come and rescue you. I mean, so he's distorting Scripture there. And he's like, no, the Lord says you not to test the Lord. So, I mean, this is if he's willing to do it on Jesus, I think he'll do it on us, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think it's important, you know, as we said earlier, that we know the truth, just as, just as David said in the you know, in Psalm 119, 11, I believe it's like, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. It's so important for us to be in the word, to be able to discern the truth, but also to withstand uh, temptation. Other thoughts uh, that you may have tonight. Uh, I know this is part one, so it's kind of got some cliffhangers in there. All right. Uh, here's the question for you as we as we think about it. Um, and there's other things on the notes, and I'll give this to you. What are strongholds? I, I mentioned that comment while ago. And what are strong? What strongholds do we often struggle with as we seek to grow spiritually? And I base it on this passage of scripture real quickly, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So let that be kind of in the in the background as you as you work through that. Other thoughts or, or comments uh, you have tonight? I know we've kind of been all over the place. They're on Facebook. It's good to have you with us. I wanted to say uh -huh. that it grows so many errors at you in so many different ways that keeps you distracted. If you're planning to go do things that God has led you to do. Mm -hmm. So, well, just for instance, getting last Friday with my car, breaking right, yeah, because I was going out to pray with someone. And so I couldn't do anything for three days because of, you know, the car. And, and then other things piled on top of that I did. And then all the stuff, and nobody in here knows anything about GPS or even mm -hmm. Todd and Shelly, but you know, the things that's going on there. So it's just right. a continual, it's a snowball effect when you're trying to do sure. what God has sent you to do. So I like how, as you were sharing that, you used the imagery of those those arrows, those flaming darts. And that takes me right back to the arm of God, mm -hmm. where he says, take upon the shield of faith. Mm -hmm. So to extinguish Absolutely. those fiery darts. And that's what we have to do in times such as these. Because, um, I mean, there'll be moments as the enemy comes at us where we may not be able to make heads or tails of what to do. But we know who who our master is. We know who our savior is. And to take upon that faith. Mm -hmm. She's talking about, you know, she's, she's somewhat 
you know, she's moving forward mm -hmm. in this battle. She's moving forward. And so sometimes we may have to be not content, but we may have to realize and not get frustrated that we're, okay, so much is coming right here. If I can just put up that shield of faith sure. and stop those from backing me up, face, just so you'll lose right. hold it firm. Right. Yeah, hold it firm right here. There'll be another day mm -hmm. and then I can move forward yeah yes, that's an excellent point because you know just as when we look at the armor of god it, it says stand firm right. and as we work through all those different aspects of the armor all of them but two were defensive mm -hmm. to stand firm in the form of god but when we look at the feet mm -hmm. fitted with the gospel offensive we look at the sword which is the word offensive but all the others there's a time where we do have to hunker down be ready for the barrage but then to get up and take the feet take the word and, and go at it again when you're used to moving forward, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's discouraging, and sometimes you won't be able to stand. But <laughs> and, and you know, part of that too, in the discouragement, because in those seasons where we have to hunker down a little bit, we're we're thinking in our mindset too. We're thinking, okay, this has been three days, or this has been a month, and I'm not seeing any progress with my coworker. I'm still doing this, but then we, you pray that the Lord helps us take a step back and say, okay, okay, Lucas. Yeah, it's been three days. It's been a month. And yes, you should have an urgency about this matter. But from an eternal perspective, it may be X number of years before this person becomes a follower. But they're going to look back at that day at work. Or they're going to look back at that conversation at Christmas. Or they're going to look back at that car ride to the grocery store. And I'm going to use that to open their hearts and bring them to a place of repentance. Well, God bless me with no towing fee, yeah. no charge for praying for us. So, I mean, that was such a blessing. We have to go in free. Right, yeah. You know, so he... He's like, I got you. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. Yeah. It was like the video has been three, four years. And the guy, well, three, so, I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, and you know... And we're impatient. I mean, you know, we, mm -hmm. want, we see a, a friend or a loved one and we want... And you need to know, Lord, we want it to happen. Right. But you're right. I mean, that, you know... And that, that, you know, as I watched that, and then too, as I shared an example about Ad Adoniram Judson, if I can say his name right, you know, laboring, or excuse me, William Carey, laboring for seven years before he saw a Hindu come to Christ. Those moments speak volumes to me as a, as a pastor when we haven't stirred the waters in a while. Now, that doesn't mean we sit back and just wait. We obviously are still proactive, and I pray we continue to be that way. But at the same time, the Lord reminds me, I have my timing. Um, yes, uh, a season of harvest is on its way, but along the way, we're growing you this way, we're growing you that way, we're teaching, we're doing all these things. And again, not to fall into a place of complacency by no means, and not to be content with not seeing people come to the Lord, because we should always have that holy zeal, that holy hunger to see people trust in Christ. But it does put it in, in perspective when you hear that. And then you see, you can't even see the guy's face because he's doing it in a place that is under severe persecution. If he's found out who he is, he could lose his life. Whereas, you know, I'm up on the hill here behind Papa John's. Everybody knows where to, you know, find us. <laughs> this is something to keep in mind. But can I, so. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, let's look on Facebook, see if they've got anything to add to the mix. Miss Patsy's been chiming in and we haven't acknowledged her enough. Let's see. Oh, Jack says the enemy definitely makes us uh, uh, doubt our salvation. He does. He wants to attack our assurance. That's why it's so important as we think about uh, the helmet of salvation, the knowledge of that salvation, protecting our, our mind and, and anchoring in the fact that, you know, there has been a time that we've trusted in him. Because the scriptures is written, you know, I write these things to you so that you may believe and you may know you have eternal life. So. Well, folks on Facebook, we're going to let you go. It's been a blessing to hang out with you, even though you're seeing half of my face. I'm like a puppet right now for them. <laughs> so you go back and watch this. It'll be fun for you. So let me end that call there. Uh, if I can figure out this stuff. <laughs>